Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics of interest to libraries. Uh, the show is broadcast live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, but if you are unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's okay. We do record the show every week and it is posted to our archives to, for you to watch at your convenience. And I'll show you at the end of today's show where you can see all of our archives and access them. Um, Encompass Live, both the live show and the archives are free and open to anyone to watch. So please do share with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, uh, anyone who you think may be interested in any of the topics that we have on the show, um, ones we have coming up or anything in our archives. Um, we do a mixture of things here on Encompass Live, book reviews, interviews, uh, products, demonstrations, mini training sessions, um, basically anything and everything. Um, and that has to do with libraries. Really our only criteria for something to be on the show is that it is something library related. And we are the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for all libraries in the state of Nebraska. So we support every type of library too. So you will see things on our show from that are for public libraries, academic, K-12, special, museum, uh, correctional facilities, uh, anything in it. We're all across the board there. <laughs> um, we do sometimes do uh, have Nebraska Library Commission staff on the on the show doing sessions about things that are uh, products or things that we're promoting here through um, the state library agency. But we also bring on guest speakers sometimes, and that's what we have this morning. Um, on the line with us uh, from uh, just a little west of here, I'm here in Lincoln, Nebraska, for anyone who knows or the state, uh, west of us from Kearney, um, is Judy Henning. Good morning, Judy. Good morning. Uh, great to be with you today, Krista. Um, I'm going to be talking you. about fake news and uh, kind of an exciting topic right now, especially for school librarians. Mm -hmm. yeah, very, well, very timely. Really. Definitely. So yeah, she's a um, assistant professor at the in the um, library school program, um, the graduate program through the University of Nebraska at Kearney. So. Um, a professor there and teaching our upcoming new new librarians getting them on board <laughs> to our profession <laughs> yeah. So, yeah so i will hand over to you Judy, to take it away and tell us everything we need to do about identifying all this fake news out there all right thank you so much krista um i look i am so excited to be with you today and and talk a little bit about strategies for identifying fake news um this is just really a popular topic I did this in the fall of 2017 at our uh, Nebraska Library Conference, uh, uh, Nebraska School Librarians Conference, which was in Kearney. And since then, I think I have done it eight times. Uh, this might be the ninth time that I presented. I've added to it and changed some things. So there, there is, uh, if, you, if you've already attended one of my sessions, uh, there will be some new Im information. Um, it's really kind of an exciting topic, especially if you are in the field of library. So I'm going to get rid of myself here and we're just going to look at my um, my slides. Um, I am, you probably know, know me as the Kearney Public Schools Director of the School Library Media Program. I retired from that position um, last spring and now am an associate, uh, an assistant, actually I said associate, I'm assistant professor at the uh, University of Nebraska at Kearney in the School Library Program. So, whoops, okay, why, why am I not able to go? Okay, um, please note my presentation is linked up here if you want to look at it. Um, I put it, uh, you may have to open it in um, PowerPoint, but um, I have linked it up there. If there's trouble with that link, let me know and I will relink it. I put it on the UNK um, cloud. So. Um, I just want to give you some background information about myself. Um, as a undergraduate, I was a journalism major. Um, and I thought as a journalism major, I would be able to write anything unbiased that I could, that it was, would be easy for me to be an objective reporter. Um, and uh, I don't know if it was just me being young and stupid or if, um, you know, back in the day, uh, writing objectively was a major focus of reputable journalists journalists out there. 
Uh, we were all supposed to be watchdogs uh, of democracy for the government. Um, this was especially true because of Watergate and and uh, so and, and it kind of um, romanticized the um, journalism field. Um, so anyway, it, it is kind of interesting that many, many years later, I go to work on my dissertation on project-based learning. And of course, I'm pro-project-based learning. I think that's a great learning strategy. And that bias definitely came through in some of the original drafts of my dissertation. I was unable to write objectively. It's very difficult to not let your personal biases enter into your writing. So I just wanted to kind of start off the session with that and let you know, um, let you know that uh, it is uh, difficult to be objective. Okay. So you know the big the big thing in education right now is being future ready, or being uh, future. Uh, 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 the students are, are career and um, college ready when they leave high school. So what do we need to do as future ready librarians? What do we need to change? Really not a lot. Uh, we just make need to make learning relevant to real life and we need to beef, beef up our information literacy curriculum to include instruction about bias and fake news. We need to make sure our students are critical thinkers and good consumers of information. We need to make sure that they understand how fake news works and make sure they understand political bias, which we all have. Okay, uh, we know the supermarket tabloids pay their sources and, and most of the time it's just stuff that's not true. I have never in my, my time as a high school librarian had a student come up to me and want to use the National Enquirer or the Weekly World News, whatever those tabloid newspapers are that you get at the um, supermarket, never wanted to use those for a source. They realize that the, those are not credible sources for their research. Unfortunately, when you take that, that information and you put it on the internet, it's not quite so easy to identify. Um, so we do need to make sure that they understand, um, you know, what is just gossip and, and hoax and, and things out there that they, they need to make sure that they're not believing as true or fact. Um, <clears throat> there's different, uh, so just like I said, online supermarket tabloids, we need to make sure that they can identify the online versions of these. Okay, what is, fake news defined as fictitious articles deliberately fabricated to deceive readers, generally with the goal of profiting through clickbait. Now we're going to talk about clickbait in a moment. Um, but um, fake news, you know, it has an alternative motive. Okay, um, just so you know that there is a small town in Macedonia the Lees, that just has a population of 44,000. And some of the smart youngsters who work there um, and can uh, speak and write fluent English, they make up a lot of the web, um, a lot of news stories that's fake news and sells them to um, different people in the United States. Um, they're just good fiction writers. There might be a little nugget of truth that might be there, and they're pros at making sure those websites um, get their fake news or they sell it to them. Um, it's interesting because uh, this is a small town of people who are very, very poor. But if you're a youngster who can speak English, speak and write English fluently, you can make um, you can make uh, a, a salary that is more than most people in that community. So um, this Macedonia site is, is uh, the source of a lot of fake news right now. Okay, so yesterday when I was on the internet, um, I noticed some things, if it goes against everything you've ever read or heard, it's probably not true. And I knew this was probably clickbait and I knew this was probably a, a a fake news website, but I, I really wanted to kind of go in there as a as someone who didn't know what they were doing. And I said, oh my gosh, the Nazis bury the true cure for cancer. Um, geez, there is a cure for cancer and the Nazis had it all along. 
Um, and then they throw in this uh, warning, controversial content. Well, that makes you want to makes you want to um, get into it all the more. And then you know, down at the bottom, it has this secrets of underground medicine. So after about 40 minutes of clicking through this tedious long thing that is not telling me anything about cancer, it's given me a cure for diabetes, obesity, infections, and dementia, but it doesn't say anything about cancer. In addition, it tells me how I can reduce the cost of prescriptions and the cost of hospitalizations and avoid unnecessary surgeries, but I still haven't found the cure for cancer. That was just a ploy to get me to get in here to click through the slideshow. So it's clickbait. That was, the, that was an example of clickbait. Um, and I'm sure most of you have done this. You see um, on the internet, you see where it says, you know, see what this bombshell actress in the 1930s looks like, or in the 1960s looks like now. And you wanna see what she looks like when she's old and gray. And uh, so, you know, they have you click through this and it entices the visitor to um, continue reading the article and they uh, get more clicks and so they get more payments for what they have on the internet. That is clickbait. Okay, here is an adorable little girl who will melt your heart. Let's see. Hi. My name is Jessica. I'm eight years old. I'm from Sarasota, Florida, and I'm nothing more than a ploy to get you to watch an internet video. I know you clicked on this video because you're bored and very easily distracted from the things you actually need to get done today. I mean, who can blame you? That's exactly what this video is preying on. The fact is, the people who posted this video would stop at nothing to get you to click on this link so it would increase the website's page views and make the advertisers happy. Let's look at the big picture for a second. If even 100 people share this video on Facebook, the website is automatically guaranteed thousands of more page views, which in turn means thousands of more dollars in ad revenue. Why would anyone spend time writing up an 800 word article when they could just put up a video of a cute little girl or make a slideshow of the 10 cutest honey badger couples? By the way, every time you click through a full slideshow, those are a separate page view. Do you have any idea how many page views a single slideshow gets? Let me tell you, it's a ton. All right. You want me to say something adorable because, well, you're lonely and you really just need something to fill the emptiness you're feeling deep down inside. Just remember, no matter how many videos you watch or how many lists you read, you're still going to feel all alone. I guess that's just the way it is. There. Hopefully that's cute enough to satisfy the all-consuming vacuum of your soul for a little while. Bye-bye. <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Okay, here we go. Where are we at here? Um... Where's my slide presentation? Hmm. You might have to open it up again. Yeah. Or, there it is. No, that's okay. Yeah, there it is. Okay, here we go. Um, so that was just a little girl that illustrated, you know, she was there. The internet is trying to get you to do things um, so that you click on a bunch of things that will make the um, uh, internet look or make it look like you viewed those pages and they will get more ad revenue. So that's clickbait. That's an important concept to understand. Now, I'm, I'm talking now more from a school librarian's point of view. Um, it's very important that we beef up our information literacy. We have to make our students to be good consumers of information. And are there lots of strategies for that? Yes, there are. There are a lot. Um, uh, if any of you have been to Kathy Schrock's lessons, uh, I have it linked up there. You can go. She has some great uh, great uh, lessons that you can actually use. She shares all that information with you. 
Um, I've also got the five W's um, that, that you can teach your students, and I think that's appropriate for elementary students. Uh, you have the acronym CARDS, which we're going to look at, and the big six. So, um, so we have, uh, you know, I think you need to decide what you're going to use. Now, if you've not used this hydrogen monoxide um, example, um, it is a great one. Now, it's been out there forever, and a lot of people have used it, and so some of your kids are going to already know it. But this is a great one to send kids to. Um, say, okay, let's go look at dihydrogen monoxide. We're going to go to this website, and, and you see it's got this, this sunflower, and it's red, white, and blue, all American. Looks like it's got some good information. And before I have them go there, I say, now, I want you to know that everything on this page is absolutely true. And the kids go to the page, and I have them look at it for a while. And I say, okay, what, what are they saying about dihydrogen monoxide? And they say to me, oh, well, Mrs. Henning, it, it causes, um, it causes um, people to die if you inhale it. And I said, yeah, that's true. And remember I said everything on here is true, and, and it can cause skin, uh, it can cause um, metals to corrode, and it can cause all kinds of terrible things. Well, what this is, dihydrogen monoxide, is the scientific name for water. And what this website was put up for is, is students were trying to a scientific experiment, experiment to determine how gullible people could be. They were in an IB school and they were doing a science fair and they wanted to win the science fair. So there, they were trying to trick you into outlawing dihydrogen monoxide. Well, obviously we can't live without water. So there is an excellent example of how you can have something on the internet that's not true because they wanted to see how gullible you would be. Okay, so if you use that, fine, it's a great one. Uh, if you don't, add it to your repertoire. Um, here's a video on the five W's of information um, uh, literacy. Uh, it's, I'm not gonna go through this. This is an opportunity for you. You can use it if you would like. Um, uh, uh, who, what, where, when, and why are the five W's, okay? Then we have the acronym CARDS. Uh, which is evaluating sources, cr uh, credibility, accuracy, reliability, date, and source, um, which is also a good one. And then we have CARP. I always kind of worried about this one because I thought maybe they'd reverse the R and the P and then you'd be talking about crap. But um, this is another acronym that people use. And the next one, oh, here's another, another website that you might want to incorporate in your teaching all about explorers. This is a website, we're not going to go there, but it was created for librarians to use when teaching information literacy. Because the information about the authors is dubious, it's, it's, uh, uh, it doesn't really uh, say anything, and as a critical thinker, you should go through there and say, well, I don't know if I'm going to really believe the information that's in this, uh, on this website about explorers. So um, another source that you can use if you are teaching information literacy. But this is the um, acronym C-R-A-A-P um, that the um, Nebraska Department of Education wants secondary school librarians to use. I always really kind of worried about this one. I didn't like my kids um, come into my class and I would teach them um, about um, currency, relevance, authority, accuracy, and purpose, and the acronym was CRAP, and the kids would go home and say, the parents would say, what'd you learn at school? Well, Mrs. Henning uh, told us about CRAP today. Um, so I, this wasn't my favorite one, but this is the one that is referenced in the standards, uh, the English Language Arts Multiple Literacy Standards by the Nebraska Department of Education. So this is one you might want to really look at. Okay, we also need to make our students aware of the URLs, the .coms, that's commercial, uh, .edu, educational institutions, government agencies is .gov, a military organization, .mil, and the NETS, um, and the .orgs. Um, now, I always preface this, though, with the fact that, you know, Carney High is carneycats.com. Years and years ago, when I was with the person that um, purchased this domain, I, it gave us the opportunity to put any, any dot that we wanted. So the science teacher said, oh, everybody's a dot com. We're going to be a dot com. So that's why we're carnycats.com. So I don't know if people really check this out, 
the dihydrogen monoxide website that I talked about earlier, that's a .org site. So, um, uh, you know, make sure that they understand that that's just one of the criteria that they can look at to determine where the information is coming from and to help them evaluate it. Okay, um, the .gov website, um, I used to say it's an official, it's an authoritative site. Um, but then uh, they, the, it has been, AS, AASL has come out and said it's probably not, uh, it is um, an official, uh, you should say it's official, uh, not so much a reliable site, <clears throat> because it is representing, it is representing whoever is in office, their political views. So um, they have talked to us about making sure maybe we don't, uh, you know, we, we uh, make, the viewer understand the, the prejudice there. Mm -hmm. okay. Google search versus subscription databases. This is so, so important. Make sure your students understand the playing field. And most of the time they don't. The Nebraska Library Commission, uh, Nebraska Access uh, databases. I make sure that my students understand that the information that they get from there is probably very reliable. And why? Because, well, the Nebraska Library Commission, they're not going to continue to subscribe to it if, it's a, if it has information that's not true. So um, if you do a Google search, however, and just go out on the Internet, then you have to be very careful. So I, I like to make sure that my students understand the, the difference between the two. Um, I had databases at Kearney High School that I would tout and want my students to use. And, uh, but a lot of times they wanted to just do their Google search because that's what they were used to. And there are times when they're when a Google search is appropriate. You know, I need a new new uh, part for my washing machine to fix it, or I want to know how to how to fix something that that's broke. Um, you know, those are legitimate Google searches. But when you're doing research, when you're doing research, you should probably rely on the subscription databases. Um, now, I, I kind of have to um, say that Google Scholar is an exception to this rule. However, I'm so disappointed in Google Scholar. I get to Google Scholar and I get the perfect information, the information that I just love, that I want to use. And I'll be darned if I have to pay for it. So I kind of stay away from Google Scholar every once in a while, but uh, make sure that your, your students understand the playing field so that they can be good consumers of information. Okay, I think we all think that President Trump invented the term fake news, right? Well, this is a picture or a, a cartoon caricature from uh, an editorial cartoonist, um, Frederick Burr Opper, and it took it was uh, published in 1894. Okay, fake news is nothing new. Back at that time, there were several major um, newspapers in New York City that were vying for subscriptions. So most uh, newspapers were sold on the corner. Uh, and people would walk by and they'd see this big headline and they think, oh, well, I want to read about that. So they would buy it, buy the um, paper for a penny and they'd get home and the, the headline was just fake. It didn't talk at all. It just like my cure for cancer. It didn't talk at all about what was in the headline. So yellow journalism is U.S. term for a type of journalism that presents little or no legitimate well-researched news and instead uses eye-catching headlines to sell more newspapers. This started in the mid-1800s in, in uh, the United States, okay? Um, we also have propaganda. Now, propaganda has a negative connotation, and probably the reason why is the pro, the person who took uh, propaganda to, all, uh, to new heights was Adolf Hitler during World War II. Now, don't get me wrong. The United States used all kinds of propaganda tactics to get um, the war to get people to promote the war effort, um, but uh, it's got propaganda has got its negative connotation because Adolf Hitler um, used it um, to uh, they they were having a a um, depression in Germany at the time and he was he was blaming it on on the Jews and so you know this was his way of of um, becoming a uh, leader in the uh, German government, and he's known for that propaganda. So fake news is just kind of propaganda, okay? Um, as journalists, we should protect democracy. Uh, what happened to the press being a watchdog for democracy? Well, you know, the word press or journalist is pretty hard to identify anymore. 
Um, I can work for the New York Times and make a six-figure salary and write uh, legitimate articles. Um, or I can have a computer and go out and blog information. Um, and, um, you know, which one is credible? You don't know uh, where, it, where it's coming from. So um, I think journalists are still trying to be watchdogs for democracy. Uh, it, but sometimes I do think that their um, political um, bias gets in the way. Okay. Uh, talk more about watchdog uh, making affairs. Um, Transparent. Um, it does not monitor government, but applies to all powerful institutions in society. Uh, so that's what journalists are supposed to do. Now, this next video we're going to watch is very relevant to what we're anticipating is going to happen here now. This took place when the Muslims were being were leaving the Middle East and coming into Europe. Um, Sweden said, "Okay, we'll let you come in." Uh, a lot of the other countries would not allow them to stay there. Now, you have to understand, when there's a lot of people um, that come into your country that you're not expecting, um, you know, you, the, the um, facilities aren't available for them, and it will kind of make a mess. Uh, that happened in the United States when we had Hurricane Katrina in um, New Orleans. Uh, people were taken out of New Orleans because of, the, of Katrina. They went to Texas in the Astrodome. And those people lived there for quite a while and practically uh, destroyed uh, the Astrodome. In fact, they had to demolish, demolish it eventually. So displaced people are going to cause a lot of uproar. Okay, let's look at this with the Muslims over in Sweden and see what happens. Oops. <laughs> Intelligence helps Oops. us meet the needs of tomorrow. Every one of us starts out as a wide eyed recruit, myself included. If I can go back and tell that kid, you'll see him do things that will help change the world. They'll change you. 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 They'll change Okay, sorry about that, having trouble getting back and forth. Um, an example of what's going on today, um, fact checking um, is, is, you know, there, it, President Trump said, oh, there might be Muslims in the group. Um, all kinds of stuff that you need to, as a um, American citizen, make sure you understand about these people in Mexico that are, uh, that are approaching the border. So did you see how the emotions of the people in Sweden uh, caused them to tweet, tweet and retweet information um, or Facebook information that was uh, shared and, and just made people mad, which the Christmas lights were not because of the Muslims. It was another reason, uh, technical reason. So, okay, here. Now, personal bias. Sometimes our personal bias 
uh, makes us want to ex uh, believe fake news, especially if it supports what we want. If if we're a liberal, we we read stuff and and it supports our views. You want to believe it without doing some checking. Um, I uh, did some uh, research, some action research here when I was uh, teaching at Kearney High School. I came to the University of Nebraska at Kearney, and I said to um, uh, some of the people um, who are uh, uh, re assigning research at the university level. And I said, what is it? What is it that our students, when they come to UNK, what is it that they don't know about research? And one of the main things that came out was they're not good consumers of information. They believe everything that they hear or see um, on the TV or in the newspaper, they're not critical about where this is information coming from. Um, here's another example. Um, uh, Time uh, newspaper, uh, magazine reporter Zeke Miller um, had been in the um, White House many times when there had been a pre press conference when um, Obama uh, was the president. And so um, he, was, he was delighted when he got a chance to come to the very first press conference uh, for Donald Trump. Um, he goes in there. Now, um, I'm assuming that Zeke is, was a Democrat and was not happy that um, uh, Donald Trump was elected. And at the time, there was a lot of, um, um, there was a lot of gossip out there about uh, Donald Trump being racist. So when he comes in, uh, it had changed. The, the Oval Office had changed for him then uh, when he was there uh, during the Obama administration. There were a lot of people in there, but he did notice that the um, bust of Martin Luther King was gone, and it had been replaced by a bust of Winston Churchill. So um, uh, he, before the press conference started, he tweeted out the fact that Donald Trump had gotten rid of the bust of um, Martin Luther King. Um, obviously, uh, he let his readership decide if that if that showed that Trump was a racist. Well, as the press conference went on, uh, he noticed that the um, bust was still there. It had just been moved to a different, more predominant place in the Oval Office. But by that time, by that time, he could retreat. Oh, sorry, made a mistake. But by that time, everything had already been um, retweeted many, many times. I don't think they could ever come up with a um, number, but it was in the hundreds of thousands. So um, just, just an example of how innocently fake news can get started. Okay, they, um, students need to know the, politi uh, the political aspects of news agencies. And um, I kind of was surprised because when I went to UNK and I did that action research, I came back to Kearney High School and I said to the social studies teachers, I said, uh, do you spend a lot of time on this? And they said, oh yeah, our kids should understand that. But I'm not so sure that they do. I'm not so sure they know the difference between the liberal and the um, conservative view, political viewpoints. Um, you can uh, go online and find out um, what publications, what their bias is. Time Magazine has a biased uh, rating that leans to liberal or to the left. Um, and then, of course, we know what all the uh, left liberal views are. And then we have Fox News, fair and balanced, if you can believe that. Um, but they are definitely a conservative um, news organization, and they represent these views. Um, at Kearney High School, I wanted students to understand the difference between the two. So in my library, my new library, we um, have had a new school build in 2016. I have uh, two um, televisions, one on the far left, which is um, CBSN, and then one on the far right, which is Fox News. And then I have, if you can see the post, the, the um, signs there that shows what they represent as far as their political views. Um, I really think students need to understand that. I had a student walk by and say, oh, you have Fox News. I said, but we also have um, CBSN. And she said, um, she said, oh, and um, I, I, I guess I just wanted to make sure that this illustrated the difference in the political views. Okay. Okay. We're going to try another one. This is 60 minutes. This on, is on bots. If you don't know, um, what a bot is, whoops, 
If you don't know what a bot is, um, this is important. This was a great class, very informative, a lot of hands-on. Hands-on is really where it's at, that's where experience comes from. They're going into programming and colored lights. This year's hands down the best. I would definitely recommend the class. Fake news articles, outrageous and salacious, bedeviled both presidential campaigns. Now, in an investigation for 60 Minutes, we have looked into how nonsense on one website breaks out to become a trending article on Facebook or Twitter. We discovered that some fake news publishers used fraudulent computer software called bots to make the articles appear to be wildly popular. Bots are fake social media accounts. Jim Vidmar knows all about bots. He's a consultant who helps products or people get noticed on the internet. So when we're talking about these bots, these are Twitter accounts masquerading as real people. That's right. By the thousands? Millions. We did an experiment with Vidmar's help. We bought 5,000 bots from a Russian website. They cost us just a few hundred bucks. And I'm going to tweet from my account what happens when 60 Minutes investigates fake news. So tweet that out. There it is. Normally, I would expect real people to retweet my message a few dozen times. Vidmar programmed our bots to retweet my message, and then he turned them loose. Hit it with everything you got. Let's hit it with everything you got, then. He got 3.2 thousand retweets. Right Wait there. a minute. I went from 300 to 3,000? Yeah. Uh-huh. 3,400, now it's 4,400. Now it's 4.4 thousand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that matters because Facebook and Twitter base their ranking of trending subjects on their popularity. The retweet of a bot looks just like the retweet of a person. On Sunday on 60 Minutes, we'll show you how fake news publishers turn fake boosts from bots into real money. The stock market is on fire right now. Now you know it. Hmm. And I know it too. This is the best time that you could be. There we go. Um, so, internet bots. I always uh, the way they try to get you uh, to to determine if you're a real person is the CAPSA, CAPTCHA. CAPTCHA. Um, this is uh, protects websites against bots. And don't you hate it when you know they say pick out the storefronts in this picture and you pick them out and you find out that you're not a real person. Uh, it's happened to me several times. Um, this is uh, this is how they try to um, stop bots. Okay. Okay. There is an article. Um, I've linked it up here. Bot or not a bot? How you can tell if they don't have a profile picture? You know, all kinds of things that was published this summer. Um, how to tell if you're? Because sometimes you might be corresponding with a bot. Okay. Um, this is interesting. I, I read some research where the more education a person has, the more willing they are to believe things that they, they read on social media. Um, they read it on Facebook, so it must be true. Fake news, news targets both conserv conservatives and liberals about the same. Okay, now I just wanted to show you, this is an example of what I would use to show students fake news websites. Now, um, you had to be careful because every once in a while there's something sexually salacious on some of these. But these are fake news websites. And then what I would have them do, I created a Padlet and they had to um, find characteristics that these uh, websites possess. Um, and they would put it on, on Padlet, characteristics of fake news. Okay. Um, so that's just a teaching strategy that you can use. Um, that you can use uh, when you are teaching about fake news websites. Um, these four are about the most current um, fake news websites. A lot of clickbait in there, um, a lot of stuff um, that uh, students need to stay away from. Okay, wonderful um, story on fake news. And the thing that, you know, as we're going through this and, and the bots and all the fake stuff coming out of Macedonia. Um, maybe we should just go to the U.S. government 
and maybe we should make sure that they outlaw fake news. I want you to think about that as you watch um, this video, this CBS Sunday morning video. Hi, folks. They say, listen, Obama and Hillary both smell like sulfur. There's nothing new, of course, about using media to commit political slander. 1796, an anonymous editorial accused Thomas Jefferson of cowardice, of running away from British troops. The unidentified author, the current toast of Broadway. Alexander Hamilton! Our revered founding fathers could sling mud with the worst of them. It's not the nastiness that's new, it's the delivery systems. A radio talk show host by the name of Alex Jones can be heard nationwide spreading the manure that fertilizes conspiracy theories all over the internet. Pizza Gate, as it's called, is a rabbit hole that is horrifying to go down. Now, the charge that Hillary Clinton and her campaign manager, John Podesta, were running a child pornography ring out of the basement of a Washington pizza restaurant did not, as best we can tell, originate with Jones. The accuser remains anonymous, but that story had real consequences. 28-year-old Edgar Welch, after driving from North Carolina, entered the pizzeria and fired shots from a semi-automatic rifle. No one was hurt. He told police he came to rescue child victims. For weeks now, people have been accusing Lissa Muscatine and Bradley Graham of smuggling children through an underground tunnel from their bookstore, Politics and Prose, to the pizza restaurant. Uh, are the threats over? No, no, they're not over. Uh, they continue both online and, and on the phone. And, and I, I really call it the weaponization of social media and the internet. What it's entitling people to do or enabling people to do is to take completely false information, make up whatever they want with no accountability. So what do you do? You call the police, the FBI. It turns out there's quite a high bar that's re required for uh, police and the FBI to, to take action, thanks to our First Amendment protections. Has that made you rethink whether the, the First Amendment needs some modifications given the age in which we live? It certainly has. You know, my father um, actually lost a job in defense of the First Amendment back in the McCarthy era. So I am probably more than most people pretty sensitive to that issue. However, we live in a different world now, and it's a brave new world that we still have not figured out. The purveyors of this stuff have been able to run rampant with no accountability and, and been able to do damage fairly freely. Hold on, though. We love the First Amendment, free speech, the right to criticize our leaders, protection, among other things, for our cartoonists, comedians, satirists. Testing, <laughs> testing, China, China. Until recently, the targets of satire were obliged to grit their teeth, grin, and bear it. But the shape of the battlefield has changed. Google, what is ISIS? <laughs> Many more people received Donald Trump's tweet reacting to the Alec Baldwin impression than those who saw the original skit on NBC. Ted, you've been doing this for a million years. The average American could never have gotten to you and said, hey, Ted, you know, you missed this point. Glenn Beck has among the most popular radio shows in the nation. Now there's parody on, on social media. The downside is that there is... There is no gatekeeper, and there's not a real feeling of personal responsibility online. In his time, Beck promoted some of the wildest right-wing conspiracy theories out there. The president's life, as you will see, is pure fiction. This is the new revised Glenn Beck. Since, really in the last year and, and since the election, been on as many sources as I can to beg the media to learn from my mistakes. You know, sometimes you have a road to Damascus moment. I've had my road to Damascus moment. And if we don't change this, if we can't find our way to each other, it's only going to get worse. Which puts Glenn Beck on roughly the same page as Pope Francis. His holiness compared media's obsession with scandal and ugly things 
to the sickness of corporal failure. If you're just finishing breakfast, look it up later, but it's nasty. It can, however, also be profitable. Margaret Sullivan is media correspondent for the Washington Post. There is now an industry out there of people who are producing things that are untrue and that are highly shareable, which is the magic word. It's engagement. It's all about engagement. If you can get things shared, you may actually be able to make money from it. How does it work? Sort of a, a fraction of a penny for every hit that yes. you get? Yes. BuzzFeed reported this, that there is a great story, that there was a group of teenagers in Macedonia who were doing nothing but coming up with fake news stories. They set up their own sites and they registered to attract advertising through Facebook. You know, they put these stories out there, I mean, made up to be wrong, but were sounded believable enough that people started sharing them and they could make, you know, pretty good money for teens in Macedonia. Just this week, Facebook implemented a new policy that will make it more difficult for the purveyors of fake news to get paid. But Fake news is far from being the greatest threat. So one of your correspondents comes to the editorial board of the Washington Post and says, here's this story which was leaked by the Russians to WikiLeaks, and WikiLeaks has just leaked it to us. And we've checked on it, and it turns out to be true. What do you do with that? Well, we actually faced that choice throughout you know, the past you know, few months. Exactly. So if it's true, you run it. Well, if it's newsworthy. Josh Ernest is White House press secretary. So what the Russians did in the context of the election was to go and take information that was stored privately, hack into it, and release it selectively over the course of many, many days in an effort to try to politically damage, or at least erode confidence in our political system in a way that did politically damage, uh, one candidate for president. If indeed the Russians have been engaged in trying to delegitimize one candidate, aid another candidate, undermine the electoral process, that comes dangerously close to a belligerent act, doesn't it? Obviously, it's an unwelcome one, uh, and that's why you've seen such a uh, such a robust response from the U.S. government. Well, I haven't seen a robust response. Well, you've seen a robust response in terms of basically making clear publicly I've and in a, private. I've heard a lot of talk. Yeah. Um, has there been any response? Well, a, well, a robust response? Well, talk matters. Uh, what also matters it is... It only matters if you follow it up with action. And before leaving on vacation, yeah. President Obama hinted broadly that action was either forthcoming or had already been taken. The president also urged us to look in the mirror. If fake news that's being released by some foreign government is almost identical to reports that are being issued through partisan news venues, then it's not surprising that that foreign propaganda will have a greater effect. Is this an area where the First Amendment remains relevant? Uh, it, I, I think it's always relevant, right? It's the foundation of our democracy. But one of the things that we accept uh, as citizens of the United States are reasonable and responsible limitations uh, on our constitutional rights. For example, and I think most famously, the Supreme Court has said you can't yell fire in a crowded theater because that could pose a threat to the public. Well, if there was one statement of one justice in one case that I could eradicate from the face of the earth, it would be Oliver Wendell Holmes' statement about crying fire in a crowded theater. Jonathan Turley is a First Amendment scholar at George Washington University. I think there is a lot of reason to be worried. Uh, there's no question that mainstream media is collapsing on many fronts. Uh, the competition from the internet is insurmountable. But more importantly, people now have the ability to create their own personal echo chambers, to go to news sources that reaffirm their feelings. The question is, how do we solve that problem? The one way we cannot do that is to look to the government. That's a siren's call of censorship. What's the alternative? Civility, 
objective reporting, a renewed respect for facts, it's a thought. All right. Um, this, I wanted uh, to repeat something that they said there about the siren's call. Um, it, if you remember in mythology, it was the, uh, the um, seductive voices of the sirens that were, were getting the sailors to come to them. And once they got there, they usually killed or destroyed them. Um, and that's what he's talking about. When If we go to the government and we say, okay, we don't want First Amendment, um, that, that's, that's going to lead to disaster. So that was um, what uh, he was talking about there. Okay, now, uh, what does fake news mean to librarians? Well, this is an actual headline. Uh, in the war on fake news, school librarians have a huge role to play. And actually, it's um, a, a bit of um, a job security. Uh, if, uh, and I have it linked up here, I'm not gonna show it, but there is a, um, uh, some research being done by the Pearson Educational Company. Um, and they say by the year 2030, because of information liter literacy, there will be more of a demand for people in our field. We will be information scientists. Okay, um, another thing recently that I wanna make sure that you know about is Eli Parsner's filter bubble. Now, I know all of you, you've been on the internet and it says, uh, can we see where you're located, allow or don't allow? Um, just so you know, that's one of the things that the algorithm is using to determine the things that you like or dislike. Uh, Dr. Crow came in here the other day and uh, she says, yeah, um, I, I like uh, the Denver Broncos, I like Volvos and I like something else and those ads are always popping up when I'm on my internet browser. Um, this is, this is uh, an algorithm that these, um, these web browsers um, are producing, and, uh, but what does it actually mean? Um, and I saw an article, and I don't remember, and I wish I had, had written it down, but this was um, a mother was bemoaning the fact that her son, who was a Muslim sympathizer, wanted to um, go over to the Middle East. Um, when they, uh, he ended up, um, they were going to come and get him and he committed suicide. And she looked at, she looked at his internet browser and every, you know, when she put in stuff, it came back from a, the perspective of a mu Muslim sympathizer. And she says, you know, why, you know, he probably thought that that's the way everyone thought. So, um, I'm not sure if this isn't something that we're going to be looking at in the future. Okay, a uh, video on how to spot fake news that you can use. Um, uh, here's a political cartoon. Uh, consider the source. He's looking for copies of the New York Times and the librarian says it's in the fiction section. Um, we need to teach information literacy and context. Uh, do it when you're doing research. Don't just come out like I'm doing today and talk about uh, information literacy. Um, actually teach it in, in the context of a research project. Um, there is a, a bogus facts, uh, factscheck.org has a, a bogus claims video that, that also can be used. Um, and this is a great place to go to check your, your facts. Um, they can ask questions to determine the truthfulness. It does take some time to get that back. These are some of the things that they have talked about. Um, Denzel Washington in 2008, did Denzel Washington call Barack Obama the criminal in chief? And that came back as no. And here's some other ones. Okay, another uh, fact check source is uh, Snoops, rumor has it, and you can go to there and check out um, facts. Okay, um, other fact checkers are the Washington Post fact checker and uh, politifact.com, and I've linked those up there. Um, along with actual pros, we have to tell our students, make sure our students understand that there are also visuals out there that are fake. Um, less than 20% of the students questioned this source where those um, daisies had been altered in appearance. Um, okay, uh, there's some uh, a link to uh, several real or fake photographs. It's very difficult to tell just with the naked eye whether or not those photographs have been um, altered. Okay, um, <clears throat> here is an article uh, that I've linked up, a tech and learning article about uh, facts becoming harder to measure and articulate. And so it encourages 
uh, teachers and educators, not just librarians, to do their best. Um, just so that you know, EBSCO has a resource uh, ferret out uh, uh, there that uh, talks about fake news uh, that you can get for free if you are interested. Uh, here's another uh, free source from the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions has a graphic on how to spot fake news. Okay, and you know at UNK when I'm teaching my school library classes, I make sure that um, um, in the reference class we talk a lot about identifying uh, good, credible resources um, for research papers. Okay. Um, I'd love to entertain questions. I know I went a little bit over and I apologize for the, the video um, snafus, um, but uh, I appreciate uh, you listening in. And like I said, there's a lot of resources on this particular um, slideshow um, and you're welcome to use them. I believe I checked the copyright on everything and the Creative Commons is you can, you can, uh, I can share it. So. Um, if there's any questions right now that you have for me, I think we have just a few minutes. Sure, yeah. Um, we did start a little after 10, so it's not a problem to run longer. And um, we'll go as long as people do have questions or anything that you want to share, Judy. So if anybody does have any questions, you can type them into the questions section of your GoToWebinar interface or any tips or anything you've used at your libraries or schools about this topic. Um, it's, it's to me nobody had typed anything during but that's okay um it's during the the your presentation is just uh, stunning to me i guess that there is so many there are so many resources out there to find out what is real what is not to develop your critical learning skills or and those last couple of just just those um graphics, the posters, the ferreting out one, and the other one that you can just post anywhere that are just, there's so much information out, out there about how you can evaluate these things properly and know what is real or not. And it's sad that there's still people that just believe the, the clickbait or the things that they just mindlessly share on their social media anyways. And I wish there was something more we could do about it. <laughs> yeah, and, and I want to reiterate, you know, I just don't, I, I think this is something that we don't want to have the federal government come in and make restrictions on. Mm -hmm. I think I think I think it's something that that we really need to take uh, to heart as uh, teachers of uh, teaching students to be good consumers of information. Yeah, and it's up to us as the as the teachers and the educators and the librarians to keep pushing all of this. about, did you check? Are you sure? Are you sure? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, is it real? Is it not? Yeah, where did it come from? All of those great tips. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so for anyone who's still here, yes, we are recording the show. The show will be available. Um, the slides, um, you had given a link at the beginning. I did try to go to that on my com on um, the link that you gave for the slides, Judy, and it looks like it's still behind. You have to log in as a UNK person. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, so that's actually behind there. So um, if you can make that link to be public, that's great. If not, you can send your slides to me, and I can post them on our um, SlideShare account, which is public. So whichever way you would... Uh, I might just send it to you if it's not too big. Sure, no problem, yeah. You can send it to me and all the links and everything will come through. So one way or another, we'll have the slides available to you guys after afterwards when the archive goes up. Okay. Yeah. All right, it looks like there's not any questions coming through. So I think that's great. We can wrap it up for today. Thank you so much, Judy. This was great. Um, Eye-opening, <laughs> uh, but lots of awesome resources out there for everyone to use, definitely. And I really appreciate you coming on the show and being here with us today. Um, I'm going to pull this back to my screen. There we go. All right, yeah, so thank you so much. Thank you everyone for attending. Um, and I think those videos, most of, I was actually glad those videos did work really well, actually, Judy. Um, we could hear the sound, no problem. So, cause sometimes that's iffy, you never know. <laughs> Good. good. So yours came through just fine, yeah. Oh, good. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So, um, as I said, we are recording today, and it will be on our main Encompass Live page. This is this page for today's show, but our main sh uh, page here has our upcoming shows, and then right underneath them is a link for our archived Encompass Live sessions. Uh, today's show will be at the top of this list. Most recent ones are at the top, and there will be a link to the recording, which will be posted to the Library Commission's YouTube channel, and then Judy will get her slides to me, and those will be posted as well for you to have access to later. 
Um, when um, it is when the recording is ready and everything's done within the next day or two, all of you who attended and everyone who registered for today's show will get a note, an email from me letting you know when it is available. Uh, if you are a big a social media user, we were talking about Facebook during today's show, Judy did. Um, Encompass Live is on Facebook. I have links to it here, and here's our page over here. Uh, so if you are big on Facebook, give us a like over there, and you'll get notifications of, of when new shows are coming up. Um, here's a reminder of today's show, um, letting people know to log in right now. And when the recordings are available, I post up here as well. Uh, last show so um you can uh, check up on here where's the last one of it there we go recording from the previous one so um if you are big on facebook give us a like and you also get notified over there uh so that will be it for today's show i hope you join us next week when our talk is related teaching digital literacy in your library um, this is uh, Amanda Sweet is our technology innovation librarian here at the Nebraska Library Commission and she's going to be on the show to talk to us about um, everything you would ever want to know about digital literacy. Okay, that's a lot in an hour, but <laughs> the basics of teaching it in your library. So please do log in and join us for that show and any of our other upcoming shows. You can see I've got a couple of sessions here already booked for November and December and I am filling in all those other dates. This is not, we do not do a show once a month, we do it once a week. So I've got other ones in the works that I'm um, nailing down. On, uh, presenters and descriptions for us. so keep an eye on our schedule to see what our new shows are come um, get as they get added other than that that wraps up for today thank you everyone for attending and we'll see you next time on encompass live bye bye